you've got to embrace mistake making. That is the vital underpinning that makes us the beacon of the world. That is what's going to give us. There was a hierarchy, and the people at the top would tell you. But now what we see is that young people go, well, that's just not the difference was the medium. The internet's still about the value proposition. You can't just get stuck up on the technology. Thank you. Well, it's, it, it is my great pleasure, you know, to speak in front of such a diverse uh, audience. And uh, they didn't thought, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry that I have to close up this mini beast series on the somewhat depressing note, you know, and I'm really not sure you want to relive the experience by downloading it on your iPod a year from now. So if the crisis is over a year from now, it might be a good experience to look back and try to figure out what happened. However, I mean, I wouldn't be that optimistic that it's over, and I don't think uh, it's going to be over anytime soon, I mean, so, uh, so that's what I have, I have to give this apology, you know. Uh, so I, I try to come up with a kind of like scary picture, I don't know if it scares you enough uh, or not, and the original title, at least the title which is on the posters was Financial Armageddon, Can We Avoid It? So that's the title I came up a month ago, by now I know, no, we cannot avoid it. <laughs> they, they could not avoid it in the States, they could not avoid it in Europe, they cannot avoid it in developed or developing countries. They cannot avoid it in China. That's pretty much where the biggest scare comes from right now, what's going to happen to China, and what the effect of the downturn of the Chinese economy is going to be to the rest of the world. So, uh, no, we cannot avoid it in Canada either, right? And those of you who have some money invested, you know, we have your pension accounts, We've all been pretty much heavily invested in equities, right? So you see that you lose value, you lose money. So that's the kind of, so I had to change it, and I changed it to myths and reality. And I changed it to myths and reality because there are lots of myths going on right now there. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard to figure out whom to blame, one, what, why we blame particular parties that are responsible for the financial crisis. So that's what I'll try, based on my personal opinion, right? And I mean, you might have your, your own opinion, but based on my personal opinion, from what I teach, from what I do research on, and also what I read about, right? I'll try to kind of set up five, six misconceptions about this crisis and try to clarify them and then see whether you agree or not. So I'll talk about why did it happen? What is the role of the complex financial instruments? Whom to blame? Wall Street, finance professors, because you know we, 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 we teach MBAs, right? And MBAs go and work on the Wall Street. Maybe we're teaching them something wrong. Uh, there is a series of bailouts, not only in the United States, but all over the world. The bailouts in Europe, the bailouts in emerging economies, the bailouts, government bailouts, even as far as South Africa. Are they good? What are the pros and cons of those bailouts? We'll talk about how the crisis is spreading to other countries. It's already spread. But actually, more interesting thing is how it's going to boomerang back, how it's going to boomerang from Europe back to North America. So because all those, you know, uh, all those countries are interlinked. So it all started from the prime mortgages and subprime mortgages markets, right? And we're all aware of that. So the prime mortgages are the mortgages for borrowers, oops, sorry, for borrowers with good credit tricks, provide a down payment, and document their income. But then there was a literal explosion in the amount of subprime mortgages given to households, mostly in the United States. Subprime mortgages given to the least credit worthy clients, low credit scores, uncertain income prospects. And there are many reasons why it happened, right? So, for example, if you take Canada, most of the mortgages would be still would be prime mortgages because it's just the way the mortgage market works, the real estate works, the banking industry works in Canada is different from how it works in the United States. So I came to McGill, I, I moved to Canada from the United States three years ago, and that was a big shock for me because my wife and I, we decided to buy a house after some time, and they asked us for a large down payment. And we were shocked how large the down payment is, 10%. What did we expect? 
we expected 5%. We expected zero. We had good credit ratings. We had good credit scores, reasonable income. So we were shocked. And then it turns out even if you put 10% down, actually because we are not Canadians, we had to insure our mortgage. So we ended up putting down 25%. We do not regret about this right now. Right? We're very happy that we decided to do it. So the mortgage crisis in the United States worked really differently. So uh, the residential investment, residential building industry has been heavily subsidized in the United States. It was subsidized uh, since long time ago, uh, I would imagine 1950s, right? So there are like small differences. For example, the interest payments in the United States are uh, tax deductible. So there was this literal explosion in number of houses, the number of commercial, uh, commercial buildings and, and, and residential buildings being built in the United States. But that was not a problem. That was not a problem because the mortgage industry worked in the old fashioned way that people give money to the bank and b banks give out loans. And you know, depending on the duration of the loan, pretty much the bank cannot give more money out than the deposits they attract. That was the initially how those mortgages were funded. And so then something changed. Something changed and investors and major um, investment banks, they came up with very innovative financial products that actually gave the rise of this uh, subprime, uh, the development of subprime mortgages. And the number, the amount of those subprime mortgages, it really skyrocketed. So just to give you some numbers, in 2001, the subprime and near prime mortgages accounted for 9% of newly issued mortgages securities. And 2001, you know, that was not like such a long time ago. And in 2006, these mortgages accounted for almost 40% of newly issued mortgages security. That's a huge increase. That's a really a huge increase, which results in taking huge risks. Because you go from 9% to 40%, which kind of like in advance, you know that those people will not be able to repay their mortgage, right? But there was, as, we, as I will try to explain to you, there were like good reasons for that. So the boom was caused by practices that made getting a loan easier, little of, or no proof of income, little or no down uh, payment, and a lot of speculation. So one thing in mind, to, one thing to keep in mind about this crisis is that there's been lots of speculation. So people were not just buying one house; they were buying ten houses and five condos. So before moving to McGill, actually, I, was, I, I taught at the University of Miami. Right? So I, I could see this how like the real estate was working in Miami. I mean, it was the hottest real estate market. Obviously, right now, it's the biggest downturn in real estate market. So it's not that right now that people who are losing houses, it's not that they're losing their only house. Many people lose what they before invested, right? Out of 10 houses, they lose nine, nine houses. So um, traditionally, banks made prime mortgages funded with savers deposits. That was like the old fashioned way, right? Uh, it was as, long, as, as far back as in 1950s. But in 1990s, uh, mortgage lenders have created new wa ways of funds to flow to prime borrowers by establishing such called government sponsored enterprises. And uh, you know them, right? It was uh, two major ones were uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These were uh, mostly government agencies who guaranteed the loans and sold them off to investors as residential mortgage backed securities. So uh, just to give us a simple example, if a bank gives you a loan, even in Canada, right? If a bank gives you a loan, the time they click the button and the loan is approved, your loan, your mortgage is not with this bank. Your mortgage is sold, resold, repackaged, and eventually, although you still make the payments to the bank, right? Your mortgage can be as far as pension plant in Iceland or Norway. So the time you approve for the mortgage, your mortgage is resold to other parties. So, and the way to do it was to kind of like channel those mortgages through those major, um, major uh, companies, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And what we were doing, they essentially were pulling different types of mortgages, right? Repackage, uh, trying to repackage them and resell to investors. So by itself, it's a brilliant idea. It's a Nobel Prize winning worth idea, how the securitization 